This whole month, we're going to be talking about the fathers. Okay, fathers. How many of you would like to listen to the message about fathers? How come I heard all the, all the ladies say David? I guess you're, you're like Zipporah, the wife of Moses. So we're, we're going to learn about that. But, but uh, we're going to be talking this, this whole month, except for one Sunday, we're going to talk to the children. Okay, We're going to talk to the children, especially those kids that do not obey their parents. Okay, we're going to bring the, the stick. Because the word of God says, spare a rod and spoil a child. So, we're ready. But again, we are going to talk about the father. So, mm, there's a, there are going to be some rebuke about the fathers. and so. But it is the word of God, so it's not my words. Okay, so you can get mad at me. Whatever I say, that's fine. But it's the word of the Lord that I'm using. Hallelujah. Amen. So again, we'll focus on fathers for throughout this month since, you know, this is going to be a Father's Day month. And so we will learn that fatherhood is a God-given responsibility and must be taken seriously. Amen. It is the father's responsibility to lead his family in their relationship with God. Don't give out of it. It's your wife to sing amen, okay? <laughs> it's a father's responsibility to discipline his children. Amen. And then lastly, we we'll learn that the children are commanded to obey and respect their parents. Amen. The declaration of Joshua in Joshua chapter 4. Uh, says that, as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That declaration covers all those that we have just, uh, I have just said, that the, the responsibility, the God-given responsibility to, is to be taken seriously. So today we're going to start with Moses. So, most of the time when we hear about Moses, we hear about the message of Moses of leading the Israelites. But before he could lead the Israelites, he needs to lead his family. He needs to lead his family first. And so let's open to the book of Exodus chapter 4, 24 to 26. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses when I was about to, what's the word? Now let's say it loudly. Kill him. <laughs> kill him. Why? That's what we're going to learn today. Was about to kill him, but Zipporah. That's not the Giuseppini uh, Zipporah. Okay? <laughs> I know the ladies got excited when they hear that. <laughs> Took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. In other words, there was a circumcision done to the kids of uh, Moses. Who did it? Not the dad. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood, to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. First of all, before uh, I go through the message here, I'd like to clarify something, okay? Because I don't want you to be listening to me because you probably heard about uh, different uh, you know, interpretation about this story here. Um, the 
King James Version doesn't name Moses here. And so some of the interpretation that you, you can read out there is that it's not really Moses that God was going to kill because of the, the previous verse tells, uh, tell, tells us that Moses was told by God that God was going to kill the firstborn son of Pharaoh as he was going to Egypt to free the Israelites. However, like I said every time, when you interpret the Bible, regardless of what version you're going to use, always go with the context. Okay? Um, you probably saw me or read my post um, this week and say, I said that scriptural doctrine must be taken as a whole and not as a scattered proof of text. So doct uh, doctrine must be taken within the context. And so it is very clear here, if you read the, from verse 18 all the way to 26, that it is Moses. Okay. Um, first of all, there's there that's on the way and during the journey. That's the, Moses was already journeying towards Egypt. And if you look at Zipporah, um, it says there, then Zipporah, or in, in, in the King James Version, it would say, then Zipporah took a knife. In the NIV Version, it says, but Zipporah. So it all comes down to this, that there was a immediate reaction that Zipporah did. Because people think, or people, some people say that uh, it is a different event, but it's not. It is all the same event. So it is really Moses here that God was going to kill. Okay. But there are three facts that I'd like to bring out here. Uh, three facts about fatherhood. Number one, God is serious about it. Okay. Number two, it is the father's responsibility to lead his family in their relationship with God. Then number three, there is the helper or the helpmate who was Zipporah. Now, how serious is God when it comes to Father's responsibility? Very serious. Okay? Because nowadays, there's a lot of fathers that are not really paying attention to their kids and they just allow the kids to grow on their own. But God is very serious about it. Again, on his way back to Egypt, after hesitantly agreeing or responding to the call of God to deliver his people out of slavery, at a resting place, God was ready to kill Moses. The context suggests that it was because Moses failed to circumcise his children, a clear violation of the covenant God, uh, covenant God made with Abraham. Let's look at that covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. Do you have that? Okay, so I just want to show you how serious it is. That's why you might be able to, you might say that, why, why did God want to kill? Because it's very serious, because this is a covenant. So let's read. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my commandments, you and your descendants, after you for the generation to come. X. We don't have that. All right, let me read. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought him with money for a, from a foreigner. Those who are not your offspring whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be 
circumcised. My covenant with you, with your flesh, is be is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Cut off means killed. Okay? So, here in this covenant of Abraham with God, God made it clear that he's very serious when it comes to agreement, to covenant. And the covenant that God made with Abraham is that every male has to be circumcised. That was the, that was the sign of somebody that belonged to Yahweh God. Now, today we have our covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, it was our faith. It is the circumcision of the heart. So the covenant of circumcision was the sign that they belong to Yahweh God. All the descendants of Abraham. Obviously, Moses' sons were outside of that covenant. Let me repeat. It is very obvious here in the story in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 4 that the sons of Moses were outside of that covenant. They did not belong to God. Why? Because Moses failed to introduce his sons to Yahweh or the God of Abraham. They were not, they did not belong to the covenant with Abraham because they were not circumcised. And so here you will find that God is very serious when it comes to children. God is heart is very close to the children. Okay? It said on the covenant that those who were not circumcised were outside of the covenant. So who should be killed? The kids. Right? Because they're the one who are outside of the covenant. But because God's heart is very close to children, he put the responsibility on the father. You see, children are very close to God's heart. Children are very special to God. If you read the story in Mark chapter 10, 13 to 16, I just want to show here how, God, how children are very important to God. Okay, this is the story when Jesus welcomed the children. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. You know, like, bless, mano. Okay, so if you, there's a boy here in our church that goes around and mano to everybody. And he will demand that you should, you're supposed to say, God bless you. As Cedric. Okay, so... So that Jesus will put his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. In other words, the disciples did not like the kids coming to Jesus. You know, they were like, you know, go away. When Jesus saw this, he was what? Indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as this. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little children will never enter it. And he took the little children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. So, again, little children, sometimes for us, you know, they're like, just a headache to us, or you know, some sometimes you know we don't care about little children, but God really loved the little children. The children. Again, you will see here that Jesus was angry with the disciples. 
because the disciples didn't want the children to go to Jesus. But Jesus was angry with the disciples. He said, do not get, get in between me and the kids because the kids are special in the kingdom of heaven. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 also instructed us this. Train a child the right way, God's way that is, when he becomes adult, he will keep doing things the right way. God is so concerned about children growing up without being trained or not being disciplined. God wants us to train our children so that when they grow, they will keep doing the right way, the right thing. So again, children are very special to God. They're very close to God's heart. And they want us and he wants us to train them in the way that they should go. We should not just let children do their own thing, but we should train them. But it is a sad situation that it's the opposite. Fathers are no longer training their children, but children are training their fathers. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Okay, like I said, you know, you can get mad with me, so that's fine. Because now it's like the day the rules have changed. The kids are not training their children. Right? Let me give you an example, and I hear this all the time. Oh, we're late to church today because the kids didn't want to wake up early. You're letting the kids set the rules. As, or either we, you know, we just allow them to do what they want to do. It's like this. It is like the children are saying to you, Mom, Dad, I know tomorrow is Sunday, but I want to sleep until 11 o'clock. And don't you dare wake me up because I'm going to be screaming if you wake me up. I don't care if we're late to church, maybe we don't have to go to church. That's basically what the kids are doing. The parents will say, okay, you're the boss. We wait for you to wake up. <laughs> but when parents assert their God-given authority, it will be something like this. Now, I said, God-given authority. It will be something like this. The parents or the father should say, Saturday night, tomorrow is Sunday. It's a church day. It's the Lord's day. We wake up at 7. We, we, we eat breakfast at 8 o'clock. Then we're off to church by 9 o'clock. Right. That is parenting. Yes. It is not it is not the way the, the other way around. I remember um, growing up in a Christian family. First of all, my I have never seen or I cannot even remember a single Sunday that my parents miss church. They were there all the time. My dad would say, okay, kids, tonight is Saturday night. You go to bed early. You wake up at seven, go to the river and swim and take a bath. <laughs> well, we didn't have shower. So we go to the river early in the morning. You know how cold it was, but hey, that's what. 
My dad said, you go to the river and swim, you know, bring your uh, Ajax soap or whatever. <laughs> Perla, yeah. <laughs> Why you laugh? I came out good. Yeah, look at me. I, I look good. <laughs> of course, this uh, with the help of the alkaline. So. <laughs> but that's what my dad. He goes, you wake up 7 o'clock, go to the river and swim, and then you come back, you eat breakfast, and we're off to church. So, because it is a God-given responsibility, we must assert our God-given responsibility. Exercise your God-given responsibility. It will not hurt your children. Does, will it hurt your children? No. no. You're training them in the way that they should. As a matter of fact, you wake them up very early in the morning when they go to school. Right? right. right? Yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to training our kids with the God-given authority, most of the time, we let our kids train us. When we fail to exercise our God-given authority to train our kids in God's ways, to make sure that they enter into covenant or with the right relationship with God, guess who God is going to deal with? Let me repeat that. When we fail to exercise our God-given authority to make sure that our children grow up in the ways of the Lord, guess who God is going to deal with? Fathers. Okay. Because it is our responsibility. And that is not just a responsibility, it is a God-given responsibility. Don't allow your kids to train you. Train your kids. Now, God put the blame squarely on the father, Moses. The sword tells us that without hesitation without giving Moses time to explain God was ready to strike him dead now that's pretty scary right and I'm not trying to scare you okay maybe God is not going to kill us but God is saying here is showing us how important it is, how serious it is that we as fathers train our children in the ways of God and that to make sure that they grew up in the right relationship with God. I mean, it, it, it didn't matter to God that he spent 80 years preparing Moses to become the one who will bring out the Egyptian, I mean, the Israelites from Egypt. As a matter of fact, if you read the story of Moses, well, he was still a baby. God saved him from the hands of Pharaoh when, you know, when his sister Miriam put him in the basket. And God trained him for 80 years. And that even at the burning bush, God even spent some time to really convince Moses to go to Egypt to to bring the Israelites out. In other words, he was God's man. He was God's man for the ministry. He was God's man to, to free the people out of slavery. But yet, for that one reason, that he failed 
to circumcise his children or to teach his children in the way of the Lord, God was going to strike him dead. You know, it's mind-boggling why God even wastes his time raising Moses and training Moses for 80 years. But again, this speaks of how God take it very seriously, the father's responsibility to make sure that they lead their children in the ways of God. That's why I always, you always hear me tell the fathers, fathers, do not send your kids to church. That is very wrong. Let me repeat. Fathers, do not send your kids to church. That is very wrong. The right thing to do is, fathers, bring your children to church and stay with them. Now, it is a very serious matter. If you look at Adam, from the beginning of time, God has placed the responsibility on the man. It was already on Adam's responsibility to train his children. I mean, look at this. Romans chapter 5 tells us that we have become sinners because of Adam. It was Eve who ate the fruit first. But the blame is put, squarely put on Adam himself. That all of us have become sinners because of the fathers. Lot. The story of Lot. Remember Lot? the nephew of Abraham, Lot failed to lead his children to the Lord. When he moved into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, see, there was, there was a conflict between Abraham people and Lot's people. And so he was given a choice. When he when he chose to move to Sodom and Gomorrah, he put himself outside of the covenant because he was within the covenant of Abraham while he was with Abraham. But when he moved out from the Abraham's covenant, he settled in Sodom and Gomorrah, and then he failed to teach his children so the children grow up in a very wicked place. And we know that Sodom and Gomorrah was judge. But the sad thing is that the lives of his children ended up in a disaster that had a ripple, ripple effect for hundreds of years. You know, the Moabites, okay? I mean, let me tell you the story of what happened, if you don't remember. When God rained down his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, he took poor Lot out of there, and he survived together with his two daughters. Two daughters said, there's no man around. Let's get our father drunk. And because of that, he got his two daughters pregnant. And there's the Moabites. That's a disaster. One wrong choice. Instead of being, having, staying with Abraham because he belongs to the Abrahamic covenant, he pulled himself out. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 says this. Fathers, what's the first word? Does it say mothers? No. no. 
It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Whose job is it to train and instruct the, their children? The Lord. The fathers. The fathers. It is our responsibility to train up our child. And again, God is very serious about it. Again, think of this. Moses was the man of God. He trained him for 80 years for that job alone. But because he failed to circumcise or to train his children in the ways of God, God did not care if Moses was going to die. That really teaches us that God is very serious when it comes to responsibility. Lastly, thank God for Zipporah. The wife, the woman. But at least, you know, this, this story here, it's kind of the opposite of the story in Genesis. In Genesis, the wife, the woman, said, let's eat the fruit. And the husband said, oh, yeah. But this one here, it's the man who was in trouble. The man was going to be struck dead by God. But the wife was there to save him. So, thank God for the wife. If, the, if you fail to train your children, fathers, but they are still, you know, having a right relationship with God, it's probably because of the mothers. Amen. Moses clearly owed his life to his wife. Without his wife, immediate action, he was a dead meat. I read a story about Billy Graham. Um, actually, there's a book written by, by his wife, Ruth. See, Billy Graham was a very busy man. He was a very busy man preaching the gospel. But who was left behind to raise his, their children was his wife, Ruth. Billy Graham was out there preaching the gospel. Thousands of people responded to the preaching of the gospel and they received Christ. But this is what Ruth Graham said. My husband was busy preaching the gospel, but all my children are on the road to hell. Wow. Wow. That is the wife of Billy Graham said. And that's, that's something that we might not hear all the time, especially for Billy Graham. I mean, Billy Graham was a very well-known evangelist. But because of the busyness of his, what he was doing, the wife said, all my children are on the road to hell. But we know that all his children are serving the Lord. And Billy Graham credited his wife for that. But it saddens me to, and I've seen this uh, throughout my Christian life, 
A lot of people that are working for the Lord in the ministries. You probably know some. Their children are not serving the Lord. That's, I, I don't want to, I don't want to judge on what to go, how the Lord is going to deal with them, but that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. But it's not only the people that are in the ministry. We could become, so, as, as fathers, we could become so busy about doing so many things. Maybe even it is for the future of our children that we work so hard for. But let us not forget that it is our responsibility to make sure that our children enter into right relationship with God. I was, uh, me, when we were in the Philippines, uh, the market preached at that church. I noticed that most of the people there, every time somebody walk in, it was mothers with children. And the next time there was somebody passed me, it was mothers and children. On the other side, people were coming in, it was mothers and children. I wonder, I said, what happened to the fathers? What happened to the fathers? I don't know where they were. <laughs> They're probably watching the, uh, the Warriors and the Raptors. <laughs> or the Super Bowl. Or the... It was election time in the Philippines, so probably... <laughs> As a matter of fact, the reason why I got connected to the church because my high school friend, who was a, my partner in crime, <laughs> was going to the church because I, I heard like, oh, yes, you know, his name was Jomar. Somebody told me, Jomar is a Christian now. So I went to the church, and, you know, to meet him and so that was the last time we were there, uh, 2017. And so this time I was excited to go there because I got to see him again. But he wasn't there. He was campaigning for election. It, it's a sad thing. Mothers walking in with the little children and like, where are the fathers? Let me, I mean, that, that seems to be the norm. Many fathers are absent in, the, absent in the lives of their children. I don't know what's for the reason, but let me challenge the fathers. Let me remind the fathers that it is our God-given responsibility to make sure that our children grow up in the ways of God. In the ways of God. Let us not be like Moses. Again, look at how serious God is when it comes to that. Moses was his man. God spent time, 80, 80 years, and he even saved Moses when he was a baby from the hands of Pharaoh. He saved Moses from the hands of the Egyptians when he killed. He was somebody. And God even spent time in convincing him to join him, to, to be the man, to to free the Israelites out of Egypt. 
He was God's man. Yet, for a simple thing that he failed to raise his children in the ways of God, God said, you're going to get it. It's a scary thing to think about. And so let me close with this by encouraging our fathers. Do not neglect your God-given responsibility and authority to train up your children in the ways of God. Yes, you can be busy with the things that you got to do, but never fail to raise your children in the ways of God. Do not allow your children to train you. Train your children instead. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to see how serious you are when it comes to training our children. Because children are very close to you, to your heart. Children are special to you. That is why you have instructed us, O Lord, to train our children in the way, in the right way, so that when they grow old, they will still do the right way. Lord, many children are lost out there because we failed to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. There's children out there who are are rebellious to their parents. Lord, you are very serious of that responsibility, that authority that you gave us. Lord, if there are kids out there that are rebellious to their parents, Lord, we rebuke that spirit of rebellion. We break that spirit of rebellion. And Lord, as fathers, Lord, help us to open our eyes to see 